We've been uh, <clears throat> discussing uh, reconciliation and trying to get it outside the realm of the way two parties would be reconciled in the natural where they'd just be brought together and somehow everything would be hammered out and worked out and people just start getting along. <clears throat> Rather, um, what took place is, and, and even if you sort of look at this picture here, this is not adequate either because we have God here and we have Jesus reconciling us. Well, let me just pull this out. When in reality, it would really look more like, let's see, see if I can draw this correctly. It would be like, here's Jesus. And we have been made one in him. Now, we have been made one with him. But probably the more clear way to say it is we've been made one in him. Okay, so for now, we're just going to um, um, put us in here, okay? <clears throat> All right. And then Jesus reconciled us to God, amen? Okay, so... You've got that reconciliation taking place. Here's the Father. Uh, here's the Holy Spirit. Excuse me, Holy Spirit, for just using. All right. So Jesus reconciled us to God. Well, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can you, can you see that you're reconciled? To God, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the reconciliation. And, and if, you'll, if you'll check it out in the scriptures and things, you'll begin to see that that really is the work we've been brought into. Now, let's just, I always qualify this. Let's just make sure we understand. This doesn't mean we're God. We're the body of Christ. He's God. We're his bride, we're his body, but we're not God. But we are one with him, and therefore we partake of his nature. Does that make sense? We're, you know, because in this oneness, a body partakes of the nature. Okay? And First Peter tells us that we have been made partakers of the divine nature. Okay, well, how does that happen? That doesn't happen outside of Jesus. In other words, Jesus didn't come do some sort of magical cross work and, and then declare to us from the throne, um, bingo, just because you got saved, you have, you, you have the divine nature. No, we have nothing outside of oneness with Christ. We have it because we are his body because we are his flesh because we are bone of his bone. That's why we have what we have because we are the, ve the vehicle and the vessel of Christ. All right, so I just felt like this was important to begin to understand that we've been brought into something that is eternal. And eternal life, folks, is without beginning and without end. And only God, therefore, has eternal life. Should I say it again? Eternal life is without beginning and without end. Without beginning and without end. Therefore, only God has eternal life. But we have eternal life because Christ is our life. Can you see that? In other words, um, he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. Anybody remember that scripture? Who knows what book it's in? First John, yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's turn to First uh, Corinthians. No, Second Corinthians. Let's go to Second Corinthians, chapter five, I think. Yes. All right. <clears throat> we're gonna we're just gonna start with uh, verse eleven. Um, 
Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Let's just stop right there. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. All right. Well, that, you know, that's uh, 2 Corinthians. Did I say that right? Um, 5, 11. Okay. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Are you picturing this big, long-toothed, creature over your shoulder going you better witness <laughs> that's my visualizations knowing therefore the terror of the lord yes lord i'll tell you. well that's not really what it's talking about it's talking about the fact of people that are separated from the lord knowing the terror of that situation we persuade men okay but this is a good jump uh, a good diving board to get into the pool and that is we have to see that there's a difference between <clears throat> uh, saving people and reconciling people because uh, if you drop all the way down let's say uh, what is it verse 19 uh, is that it you know let's just do 18 and uh, through 20 because <clears throat> now I want you to notice the word reconcile, reconciling, reconcile, that word over and over in these scriptures. Verse 18, and all things are of God who hath reconciled, notice that that's past tense, reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, okay, and hath given to us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. To wit, that, to wit, to wit. The ministry of reconciliation to wit or this is it to wit that God was in Christ reconciling okay all right that scripture is just as plain as it can be verse 19 God was in Christ reconciling again two ways you can read that and I've heard it I've heard it more often than not this first one that I'm going to give you that God was in Jesus and God's in there reconciling us. Well, you know, first of all, it's not really that. God was in Jesus. That's a fact. Okay. But I don't, I don't see any example of God being in there going, uh, you know, like Jesus is his covering, you know, and I'm going to reconcile these people, you know, like, <laughs> you know, whatever. I don't know. I know. I've, 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 yeah, you know, or something like that. No, God was in Christ, in, in Jesus. Not that he was in there, but God in this understanding of in Christ was reconciling unto himself. Okay. Now, that's consistent with the, uh, the context of the scriptures here. All right. And that's, that's for you to search out and, and check out. But let's continue to read here so you can see that. Um, the first verse 18 is telling us we've been given the ministry of reconciliation, and this is what it is, to wit, that God, this is what we're supposed to be proclaiming, that God, through this reality of in Christ, was recon reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Okay? Now, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We, we pray you, we beg you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So what the statement that we made was there's a difference between saving souls and reconciling men to God. All right, well, that's good. That's good that, that you realize that because I, I fear there are a lot of people <clears throat> who are out witnessing and they're telling people that Jesus died on the cross to save them, which is, and I'm, you know, I'm going to save them from hell and to save them from punishment and to, to you know, save them from um, a bad seed that has been sown. That's not the ministry of reconciliation. 
And that falls, uh, while all of that is true and wonderful, it is not as wonderful as reconciliation, especially in terms of what we're describing here. God, you know, you've got the ministry of reconciliation. This is the, this is what it is. God was reconciling you in his son. That's much more than saving you from a pit or saving you. That's literally union with Christ. That's literally having an eternal surety that can never change. Whereas, you know, you, you hear people talking about, well, can you lose your salvation or not? Well, you know, if you really understand reconciliation and you by faith hold fast the profession of your faith, you can't lose your reconciliation because he is that. He's what makes that real. You see what I mean? I mean, it's as secure as Jesus himself. And, and would, would take some means to separate us. And, there, and, and in his mind, in his heart, and in the work that he's done, that's not possible. The only door left for us is that we just flat out deny that that's true. Okay. And, and I, I believe that is true, that reconciliation is true for people who don't even have any comprehension of reconciliation. They just prayed a prayer and thought, I got saved. Am I making sense? I mean, they, you know, but they just, and, but I believe that that reconciliation is still valid. They're not walking in it, and therefore they're walking in fear and condemnation at times. And, you know, feeling like God doesn't love them at times. And all, the, all those things that are, that can only happen outside the realm of Christ. Jesus in a move that would secure us eternally with him, in him, with him, um, joined with us. And now we are joined with him by our faith that that is true. And it's, it's unchangeable. And so, um, and one of the things I was noticing here is uh, verse 14. Of course, uh, there's some great scriptures all throughout this, but it says, For the love of God constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Okay, here we see the love of God bringing about our death. You see it? The love of God constrain us. The lo you, could, you could say in a certain sense, and I'm not trying to put words in the, in the mouth of the scripture here, but the love of God put us to death. Verse 14. The love of God constraineth us because we thus just that if one died for all. Okay. On what basis then? How is that love? Isn't isn't that, to put us to death, isn't that more righteousness? Think about it. Remember the half? and Isn't that more righteousness? I mean, doesn't it make sense that it would be more righteousness? Well, the scriptures are clear that, that Jesus, um, in order to um, remedy righteousness, um, went to the cross. Do you agree with that? It's true. <laughs> I hope you agree with it. <laughs> if you don't, we need to have a little prayer meeting in the back there for a little while. <clears throat> but, uh, but he died to, to, to bring about that, um, to remedy that situation of righteousness. Why? And we'll just give a quick thing again, because God is righteous, and we are not, and he cannot um, um, join to that which is sin, in the sense of agree with it and, you know, uh, become one with it or ignore it. Um, and so part of the cross was to remedy righteousness. <clears throat> but we know that he didn't have to remedy righteousness. You know, we say, well, he's God, he ought to. 
No, but he's, no, I mean, he doesn't have to. You know, we're the ones who messed up. <laughs> okay. But love took him, took him to the cross to remedy righteousness. But that wasn't all that he did, folks. Love took him to the cross, and love put us to death for verse 17. Uh, therefore, if any man be in union with Christ, he's a new creation. That's, that's better than just dealing with the sin question. Amen. That's made us one. That, we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. We are joined. With, and if any one of us is in there, I don't care how you act, what you think, what stuff you go through. I don't care. You are a new creation. And when did that happen? When Jesus rose from the dead, you rose with him, and you are seated with him in heavenly places. And so, again, with the example that Mallory gave us in the last class, when he looks at Peter, he sees a new creature. He's not looking at a guy that failed, even if it just happened three days earlier. It, it changed everything. And, and the best thing we can do is, and I'll put it like this, I mean, is to look into his face and see what he believes That's right. and then start believing that, Amen. you know. I mean, haven't you ever, anybody ever experienced this where, man, you just did a bunch of stuff wrong. You did stuff wrong that just wasn't the Lord and everything like that. And so you're really sort of waiting for the Lord to catch hold of your collar and pull you aside and, you know, have a little talk with, with you. And... He sends somebody along and they end up blessing you or giving you something. And it's beyond what you could have imagined. You're just going, I mean, that happened to me once. And someone gave me a guitar. And it was beyond, at that time, any guitar that I'd had, electric. I just went, what are you doing to me? <laughs> You're trying to shame me? Are you trying, you know? <laughs> you know and, and, you know, I just, it was like... I would, here's what was going through my mind. Take that. I would rather you not have done that. I would rather you come with a big belt and just beat the fool out of me. You know? So you're going, why would you do this? And the answer is, he's not trying to shame you. He, there's nothing to shame in his eyes. <laughs> You know, he, he is loving you according to, like I said, he loved you enough to put you to death so that you would end up in Christ, a new creature, one with him. Clean, fresh, brand new every day. His mercies are new every morning. His compassions, they fail not. Why? Not because of just a work, because of Christ and because of, that we're in him. That's, that's much more than just a work that did some magical thing. Oh, thank you for the word. No, thank you for Jesus. Thank you. We say, thank you, Jesus. But what are we even saying with that? Are we saying, thank you for what you did or thank you for you? Yes. You know? And I know there are things to thank him for, so, so don't get under condemnation for that. But... <laughs> But there is this reality that what God did, he did in Christ. To wit, God was reconciling us to him in Christ and making it permanent. Let's go beyond permanent, eternal. And we receive the life of Christ, that's eternal life because it's without beginning, without end. Okay? We all had a beginning. And I don't care if we live forever, you know. I mean, people used to say stuff like that to me, you know. They'd go, well, you know, I'm glad we got eternal life. I said, everybody's got eternal life. No, they don't. No, these people. You know, what? of course, they're referring to the fact that I got saved and I'm going to live forever. You know, I said, hey, yeah. You know, yeah, that's it. Because, they, you know, they, well, they're going to live forever, too, in hell. You know, that's it. But that's not eternal life. Eternal life is without beginning and without end. That's Christ. And again and again and again, all glory goes to you, Jesus, 
and I love you, Jesus, and not just your work, and not just the, you know, not just thinking of you in terms of one of the best workmen I've ever known, but as um, taking us, I, I like, I like the picture at this point as we consider these things. I like the picture of Jesus overlooking Jerusalem. And he knows he's going to go to the cross. And he looks at them and he starts weeping. Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. <clears throat> and, and our hearts... <clears throat> Our hearts see our Jesus weeping. And we're, you know, we're much below him. We're, we're not in the know. It's like daddy crying or something, you know. We don't know, we don't know what's going on, but we want to know his heart. And so we, we look at those scriptures more clearly. Why would Jesus weep, you know? And of course, of course, you hear a million sermons. Well, he's looking at Jerusalem and they rejected him. Or, they, you know, in the sense of, you know, he was the Messiah. Or, or you know, they're in sin and he, he's weeping over their condition. Or, but Jesus said, I would have gathered you as a hen does her chicks. And, and that kind of gathering is different than than a, a gathering of puppies to her mom. You know, as I've told you the story, I, and when I was a missionary in Jamaica, part of my responsibilities was to take care of the chickens. And, <clears throat> and the mother hen would have all these chickens just running crazy in the, in the chicken coop. I mean, you know, you're trying to feed them, you're trying to count them, you're trying to, they're just going all over. And I mean, they're just, it's just crazy. But when mama, I don't know whatever she, signal she gave, when they would come, they would all disappear as if there were no chicks there. And she would become this big spread out lady. <laughs> <clears throat> but I mean, she would, she would bring them the, the, the true picture, isn't it? They would be gathered in her. Because you couldn't see them. Were they there? Yes. Okay, Jesus is saying, I would have done that to you. I would have gathered you in me, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't have that. You were wanting somebody to come as an external guy to fix this, and I'll do that, and I'm a great manager, and I'm a great worker, and I'll do all this stuff. And we'd all go, yay, Jesus, you're the Messiah. And Jesus said, I didn't come to do it that way. I came to do it this way, and I would have gathered you in me. And you would have been reconciled to God in me, not by me. But you would not. Now look at his heart when he weeps over that. I mean, consider his heart. That's more than just a job. That's, he wants us close. How close? Remember what we read in last class in Ephesians to make us nigh? Well, Israel was nigh, was near. They were near, and he did a reconciliation in himself, and now he calls them near, but it's a different near. See, it would be, again, like a, like a, a, a mom with, with puppies, you know, a dog, and it's got all these little guys, and they would get close. Well, that's like what Israel was. They were close. But he changed the way of operating. He was in the tabernacle right there close. But he changed the way the word was made flesh and tabernacled among us. And then he came inside of us. That's close. That's close. All right. Those tears, they're, they're, they're writing a book. They're explaining a heart. They're um, declaring um, something outside of religion. They are, um, they are describing a person who's shedding them. They are, 
the story of those tears, if we would just take, you know, take them one at a time and examine the story. And then this one, you know, and the, uh, what is it telling me? What is it telling me? It's telling us more than he doesn't want us to go to hell. Right. Right. I would have gathered you like that. He's not just saying, well, I'm a good God. He's saying, I want to be your life. I want to be your protector in every way by, be, by you being in me. There is, you, you can never be unreconciled in me. No matter what you go through. <clears throat> All right, so, now, no condemnation with this, but, I mean, how, you know, does he not sort of look at us when we have been reconciled? Thank God that brings him solace. But when we're so freaked out about what we haven't been or what we haven't done or whatever, and, and, and he, sa he would say, you know, just come up in my bosom and, you know, just be gathered up into my bosom and, and rest. And, you know, <clears throat> the fact that, that Hebrews is dealing with that, of, of rest, and the fact that he's dealing with it, think, I mean, you have, to, you have to let the Holy Spirit break this stuff down instead of building upon the religious things, the religious uh, concepts that we've been fed um, the Lord is crying out in Hebrews that we enter in <clears throat> that's not salvation they left e Egypt they left the house of bondage they left all of that they're saved they're God's people they're the Israel of God. They're the people of God already. But the Lord, the Lord, after so long a time, is still pleading, not in a, not in a like uh, we're failing as much as <clears throat> we're, not, we're not seeing his heart and being moved by that to enter in. <clears throat> so we... We fear and we go through stuff. And, and I, I, I even know, you know, I know how <clears throat> carnal mind works and I know how we think. We think, well, yeah, but Israel was saved from Egypt. They were saved and God brought them out. And because they didn't enter in, they died in the wilderness. So that's probably happening to me, <laughs> you know. I mean, I, people think that way. People think that way. And, they, and so, so they can never rest. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? They can never rest because it's like, well, this, here's a loophole. Uh, they died, so I'd probably, you know, and there's a warning there. <clears throat> Do you, first of all, you have to realize it, it's this, throughout the Bible, through all these stories, <clears throat> it's the same old story. It's Christ and him crucified. You have to get out of you and see Jesus. Okay, so here they come. They come out of Egypt as his body because you don't come out of anything. You, you come out of Adam by, by being in Christ. Amen? Okay, so they come out. And so what needs to take place before you can enter into the fullness of him is you need to die at the cross. So they died off. But they also entered in in resurrection in a new form. That's both are, are, are them. It's, it's, it's Christ in death and Christ in resurrection. It's Christ's body in death and Christ's body in resurrection. It's all one. You don't, you don't go, I'm just the dead part of God. You know? <laughs> God, you, you know, I mean, it's just ridiculous. And again, and again, no doctrine, no teacher, no the theology is going to get this through. <clears throat> somewhere, and I'm just using this as an example, somewhere you have to see the tears. And you have to say, Holy Spirit, you're the only one who can get me into the veil of those tears. I don't know what that is. And I, I think I'm, you know, falling short of, of his heart, not of 
of the plan or, you know what I mean, of the things that we think we're falling short in. I'm not good enough or, you know, I've, now I've done it. I made Jesus cry or something. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah, you know. Well, you know, the carnal mind's amazing. <clears throat> All right, so so you just, you have to say, carnal mind, shut up. Quit trying, to, you know, I don't want to figure this out in light of all of the religion that I've been fed. Holy Spirit, get in here, get with me, and, and <clears throat> if it takes me 10 years, and again, I'm just using this as an example. It's not this specific thing, but I'm trying to, you know, if it takes me 10 years, I need at least an explanation of at least one tier. I, I need to know my Jesus. I, I, I can't live this way without seeing life and without seeing him and without my heart being moved um, without my heart being moved towards him instead of, uh, uh, well, I'm a Christian and I'm saved and I go through things, but God still loves me. And, you know, some sort of, you know, dried meat, beef jerky sort of mentality in our minds and not, not embracing that living heart, that, you know, sacrificial heart and, and feeling it beat and knowing the spirit behind it all. <clears throat> anyway, um, so I see, let me just see. <clears throat> I wrote some notes in my Bible just before I came. Um, are we saving people or reconciling people? Saving may mean Saving them may mean we're still knowing them after the flesh and not after Christ. And that's just the next verse down, or uh, where is it? Where, verse 16, wherefore henceforth know we him no more after the flesh, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Okay, <clears throat> uh, verse 16, where, wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. All right, what does that mean? This is explaining it. This is a this is the reconciliation. This is the the actual real deal that God got all wrapped up in, not on a chalkboard and with some circles, but God gave himself to. God. And he gave himself to this. And 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 it was so that we wouldn't have to know Jesus after the gospels. But after in Christ reality. And you wouldn't have to know you after the gospels. Well, I'm Peter and I failed and, and I'm Judas and I did this and I'm, you know, and I'm, you know, Thaddeus and I didn't do nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, know, I mean, we, you know, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna find ourselves in the in the circle. What was I? Oh oh yeah. My mind is weird, I agree. But <clears throat> I was thinking about Noah, and I was thinking, you know, I just meditate on stuff, and I try to let the Holy Spirit deal with me. I know this probably isn't very much of God, this first part, but I was thinking, you know, if in the ark when they got the two animals on there, if they ate two pigs right off the bat before they had babies, that would have been the end of bacon. <laughs> oh, okay. But there's, but I, I but, but I, but there was more, there was more. And that was, I was thinking, you now when we read the story or somebody's preaching the story of Noah and they're telling us in, in the ark, in Christ, you understand that, that same truth, that that's how you get through the judgment. But you go through the judgment, you don't, you don't miss it. The ark isn't raptured, folks. <clears throat> You know, it goes through it. In Christ, we have, go through the judgment at the cross. They go through the judgment without the cross. Amen? Okay. But I was thinking that, you know, when we preach knowing everything, where are we at in that story? I don't think any of us specifically say, well, I'm Noah. But, or I'm, you know, uh, Josie, his, you know, 
Yeah, you know, or something, you know, or what? I don't think we go through that. But we're we're Noah, you know what I mean? In general, general, you know, the or we're one of those guys. We know that that's where we are. Okay, right? I mean, every, anywhere you preach this, we're there. Okay, out of the whole world, there were only eight people. But the whole world says I'm in there. <laughs> yeah. I'm in there. Only eight people were in there. But we, nobody says, well, we've already got over eight. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? I mean, you have more than eight in just a regular service. <laughs> you know. All right. <clears throat> the point is, folks, we're always putting ourselves in there instead of just being in Christ in there. That's the point, that we still have to sort of be, you know, I'm, I'm up close to Jesus, I'm Peter, or I'm, you know, better than Peter, I'm David, or I'm, you know, this or that, or whatever, and, and all these stories we always identify somewhere, instead of just going, you know what, I'm in there, I don't have to see myself, Amen. I don't have to have explanations, Jesus is my explanation, he said that he joined with us, he took us to the cross, we're crucified, and that we're raised up together with him and made sit together in heavenly places in Christ. And so now I am secure because of the Christ I'm looking at, not because of me trying to see me in that. It makes a big difference, people. It makes a big difference between trying to see me in that and just saying, hey, you know what? I'm happy that my identity is gone and now Christ, I'm identified with Christ. If anybody wants to know anything about me, just go talk to Jesus because I don't exist outside of him. <laughs> and you're okay with that. You know, but we go, no, no. I want to wear a yellow shirt. What? You know, I mean, you know, we're, in other words, we're still there. We're, we're, you know, stick out a little bit or something like that. <clears throat> All right, let me make sure I got this. So, saving, just saving somebody, getting them saved, I'm running out of time here, but just to get somebody saved doesn't, doesn't automatically change the relationship to a relationship of being reconciled. To get them saved you still know them after the flesh. You're so and so. You grew up here. This is what you do. This is what I, well, you're so and so, and da da da. So we're all saved, but no one's reconciled. I mean, we are, but no one's functioning in it. So that's why it's talking about this here. Um, wherefore, know we no man anymore. After the flesh, though we knew Christ after the flesh, yet henceforth know we know him no more. Therefore, what's it going to say next? <laughs> therefore is clearly he made that statement so that he could say, you know, that. I mean, if it says therefore, you need to know what it's therefore. therefore. <clears throat> okay? So he says, you know, we don't know you after the flesh. And I don't know Jesus after the gospel flesh anymore. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. That's where that context of that scripture is. It's a reconciliation scripture, not a salvation scripture. Yes. Yes. I'll read it. You wrote that. Oh, I wrote it. <laughs> Maybe I should start reading what I write then. <clears throat> Maybe I should re-familiarize myself. <clears throat> All right. Uh, she just said uh, the bride, the crisis life. life study manual on the bride. I think it's number eight. There's a chapter in there called Let the Reconcile Be One, and Kelly is recommending it. Recommending. All right. <clears throat> um, there, well, you know what? We got a whole crisis life study manual called In Christ. Anyway, um, but the goal would be not to read somebody's book and say, I got it. The goal would, you know, I don't care whose book. I don't want you reading my stuff. I want you to go there and say, Holy Spirit, 
tell me what, what the truth is that you want me to get out of this. That's the goal. That's, that's the purpose. All right, let me make sure I got all these little hints here. Yes, I did. Uh, let me see. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. He's saying, listen to this definition of ambassador. See, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God was beseeching you through us. It's that union. It's that oneness. It's that, it's, it's the, you know, I'll just say it like this. Paul understood the reconciliation, not just the salvation. And, and it was powerful to him, and it, and it guided, listen to this, it guided his hand as to how he said things. And God, the Holy Spirit, helped guide his hand to make sure that it wasn't just another salvation message so that we would read over the top of it and say, well, I know about winning souls. It's not a salvation message. It's a, it's a, it's being in Christ, being in union with Christ and letting that change your view of you and change your view of Jesus. It'll pull it, it'll pull, it'll get, here's what, and I'll end with this. It will change you from seeing Jesus as he was in the Gospels to seeing Jesus as he is in resurrection now. Not a historical Jesus 2,000 years ago in the Gospels, but a present day Jesus resurrected and us raised in him and him being our resurrection because we're in him and if it happened to him, it happened to us. He is my resurrection. I claim no resurrection apart from him. You, you, you see the point of that? All right, let's, let's pray. Father, we just ask you to, uh, to glorify your son in the power of the Holy Spirit in this place not just in this physical place, but in our hearts and in the word and in our meditations and in, in our daily grind that we can so saturate till we get to the place that the spirit of God just won't shut up. He just keeps talking about Jesus. Father, continue to open our heart to the heart of your son who wept because he so longed for us to be so near that it would end in oneness and that we won't continue in our Jerusalem Jewish understanding of ourselves or whatever it is will be hid in Christ. We'll be gathered as a, as a chick into him and hid and he'll be seen and that's all that will be enough for us. So Father continue the rest of this year to soften our hearts and to prepare us for yet things to come this year that will show forth Christ in a greater measure and will free us from ourselves and from our carnal mind unto him. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.